you are waiting for that golden moment when your children are normal. I have news for you, it's only a moment. <laughs> you don't get to be normalized and then stay there. Normalization is a good day. <laughs> I'm serious. It's a good day. It may be followed by a day that isn't so good. I mean, there are all kinds of reasons for a child to become, you know, disequilibrated. And so what happens is, we say a child is normalized when a child has more good days than bad days, right? And so it looks like a static state. But it really isn't. It's a balance. It's a um, normalization really means um, a, a, a balance that the child is in uh, with with the inner self, sort of the outer environment, and a lot of factors which conspire to, to bring the child to the point where the child really can attend, where the child can really focus. And we're living in a pathological culture where there are all sorts of reasons why children can't focus. So normalizing youngsters. Uh, I mean, it isn't anything you do, it's something that comes from within the child, but achieving normalization through a stable and predictable environment uh, doesn't necessarily uh, succeed easily with some children because the children may be leaving you to go into a very turbulent environment, so when they come back, then they're not in, you know, they're, they're even farther from normalization the next morning than they were when they left you in the afternoon. But we're not going to be able to change that. Again, I think over time, Montessori environments do provide for a really steady, stable kind of setting for children, and I think over time it takes over. But this is not the time. When you're at the beginning, you're in a maximum time for social dishevelment right now. It's true, school is starting, lots of things are new, you have a new group of youngsters, um, you have to focus, you've got to redo all of the social systemic issues. You know, every class has to deal with what I call the rules, the roles, the routines, and the rituals, okay? And, okay, what is, and so, first of all, you have to know, who, you know what the roles are, and then you develop the rules, which are hopefully few but well kept, and then the routines are the ways in which you live your life together. So this is the social system of your class, and that exists separately from the curricular path. The curricular, curricular path is the road you take the children on to accomplish the, the goals of the curriculum. Curriculum means either a course of study or a way of life. I think in a Montessori classroom, it's more a way of life because the social system is also very important. Okay, but this is the time of year when you've got to worry about the rules and the, role of, uh, the, and the roles and the routines. And the rituals, you know, you may, when children have a, um, um, a birthday, there may be a way that you celebrate it and everybody knows what that is. And so you want to reiterate that that's what happens. I, all this kind of thing. I know you're all very familiar with and you've all had the same kind of experience uh, you know, in other kinds of teaching. But you need to make this explicit for children. They're not going to be able to figure this out if you don't tell them. Meeting every child's individual needs. Again, you want to meet every child's individual needs across the course of the year. You will not meet every child's every need every day. You're not going to, I mean, it, because the day is not the right unit. Of, of reckoning for children developing these kinds of, of, uh, of dispositions, right? I mean, what you need to do is organize your week so that you, if you, however many groups you break your children into, so that you have everyday access to every group and or, or in every subject area you deal with, you make sure that you systematically uh, meet with every group, very much as you do when you have a reading program and you have, you know, the diamonds, the uh, rubies, and the zircons. I mean, it's that kind of thing. You need to do that. You will meet every child's individual needs as you get to know the children and you get to know them in their specificity. But you don't need to deal with them individually in order to meet their individual needs. You can meet their individual needs within the context of a small group. And many of you are going to need to do that because you have I mean, 22 children, which is a wonderful, those of you working in, in, in the Grand Park you, and it's a wonderfully good number of children, but it still is a lot of children if you have 22 groups of one child. Okay? And you also have some help. But still, the standards that you hope to adhere to are very strong and high, so, so that's, that's, going to be, that's going to be difficult. As long as you organize the class now, at this time of year, according to this model, you are going to be meeting children's individual needs. Because what you're doing is you're orienting the group now to the way in which you're going to share a common life. Right? Developing a classroom culture. Okay, some of you are concerned uh, about what to do with children who are really ready to speed ahead. 
Now, and this is a dis disconcerting experience that all teachers have when they're when they are faced with children who are super bright or who come to school and they are at a place where other children, you know, have not even begun to approach, right? And the tendency, uh, a tendency, can be, uh, you know, to try to hold those children uh, back because. Uh, moving forward with them represents a whole other set of challenges. But I think this is a group challenge. Again, just as you're preparing materials which you're going to share, you need to get together as a group with teachers and look at the needs of children who seem to be moving very, very rapidly and who may become, may, the word, favorite word that parents use, and it's probably a word that, that has some currency, but I question it's total currency, is bored. Bored is the key word. When you hear a parent say, my child is bored, right? What I find very often, misbehavior is related to children not being appropriately involved. In. So some of your mischievous youngsters may very well, they may very well be, be do, using each other's equipment instead of using what's available because <laughs> they're, somehow they're looking for something that they're not finding. But this is, this is a shared concern. I mean, every, every classroom teacher has these youngsters. And uh, uh, it's important that they be given things that they can research. And Montessori education really lends itself to this. And it doesn't mean that you have to know everything that the child wants to know. It means that you need to put the child in the way of getting information, and the child can feed back to you and you can be supportive of that. I mean, I have had youngsters, uh, uh, I've worked with youngsters who were really sort of computer science experts who knew all kinds of marvelous stuff that I didn't even know. I half the time didn't know what they were talking about. But the fact of the matter is they knew. And the fact is they were willing to share this and they were willing to talk to other children about it and all that. And this was an interest that they had, that they had cultivated and their parents had cultivated. And it was a real enrichment for the class. And it occasionally gave them opportunities to do things which kept them occupied and which, were, you know, which was very helpful for them. So it doesn't matter, the teacher doesn't always know fully what the content uh, of, of the children's interests is. It matters that the teacher be able to facilitate the child moving in that direction. 